So I want to talk a little bit more about um, God's economy in terms of what differs um, from God's economy. And uh, remember, God's economy, the Greek word oikonomia, is where we get the word dispensing. And it can be translated stewardship, administration, dispensing, dispensation. Dispensationalism comes out of this word. Uh, how Paul was given a dispensation of the grace of God for the Gentiles. That word is oikonomia. Um, and, you know, as I said, the picture, when you put this word uh, and all its usages together, a picture emerges that the father has a great house. And in that house are many children. And he's unsearchably rich. And he has a stewardship to dispense and administer the riches in the household to the children so that the children can be equipped and supplied and provided with everything they need to partake in the affairs of the household and express that household. And scripturally speaking, the many sons are us, right? And the stewards are the gifted ones, specifically the apostle, prophet, evangelist, shepherd, teacher, um, who are given by Christ to equip the saints for the work of the minister under the building up of the body of Christ, right? And the body of Christ built up becomes the habitation of God in spirit. Um, and the, the, so the, so the stewardship dispenses the riches and the riches are the unsearchable riches of Christ. And you can find all this in Ephesians chapter three, verses one through 11, where Paul talks about his ministry, which is, a, which is to handle the riches of Christ as a stewardship and as a steward to dispense those riches in God's house so that Christ becomes everything. He becomes our food. He becomes our drink. He becomes our clothing. He becomes our wisdom. He becomes our supply. He becomes our sanctification, our righteousness. Our Paul ministered Christ as everything. And so did Peter and John. And that's what's unique about their ministry that's different than everything that went before is that now Christ himself has been given in his resurrection as the life-giving spirit to be dispensed into his body and to do all the work of regenerating, transforming, feeding, renewing, building up, and eventually transfiguring and glorifying his body. And this is all carried out by his economy. And that economy has a stewardship, and the stewardship is the New Testament ministry of the Spirit which gives life, which is described in 2 Corinthians. Um, and through that ministry, it's not just a ministry of words, like Moses shouted from the mountain, words, you know, that were written down on stone. No, these words are actually a working of Christ in power uh, as he actually etches himself into the hearts of the hearers through faith and writes himself into their hearts so that they become living epistles that will shine with him for eternity. Christ himself is wrought as an exceeding weight of glory into the believers through the New Testament ministry. He's being literally supplied through the ministry of the New Testament. We receive him Grace upon grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. We are being saturated with Christ. He's flowing. He's a river of living water flowing out of the throne of God and of the Lamb to satisfy our thirst and satisfy our hunger and nourish and comfort us while supplying us with himself and filling us with himself. And one day we're going to overflow Sometimes we overflow now and rivers of living water come out to refresh others. And when that happens, Christ is worked into them. And whatever is worked into them will remain in glory. Uh, we'll be able to survive the fire, right? 
And if you understand this aspect, this this view of God's economy, you'll understand what rewards really are all about too. We have to build by supplying Christ. In contrast to wood, hay, and stubble, uh, which is something else. And that's what I want to talk about here in 1 Timothy, where Paul says to Timothy, you know, I wanted you to stay in Ephesus. It's interesting, Ephesus gets so much attention. Ephesus, God loved her. She was the maiden of choice. He sent Paul to Ephesus, and then Timothy to Ephesus, and eventually John to Ephesus. There's so much ministry and revelation that comes to the church at Ephesus. It's truly remarkable. God's economy was revealed to the church through the church of Ephesus, and the riches of Christ went out from the church of Ephesus. John's gospel was a ministry of the riches of Christ by a mature steward. It was the maturity of the New Testament ministry, the gospel of John is. It was the peak of the New Testament ministry. Nothing's touched it like that since. Um, but he says, I besought thee to abide in Ephesus, right? Then I went to Macedonia, that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions, rather than godly edifying which is in faith. Now there's the word. In some translations it says, rather than the stewardship of God. And in others it says the administration of God. But that word is oikonomia, God's household order his economy okay so there were the teachers that were teaching things that ministered questions rather than God's economy which is in faith so God's economy works by faith by believing in Christ we receive him as supply and he's dispensed into us and a ministry that is according to that economy will settle hearts and satisfy them and cause them to rest in faith versus these other kinds of ministries which on the one hand was fables and genealogies but on the other hand he's going to say it's the law which we'll get to um, these things ministered questions you know the fables and genealogies to me falls in and I love a good Nephilim yarn but the Illuminati Nephilim stuff is basically Jewish fables I mean, it's, it's rooted in truth, don't get me wrong, and yet it's been spun up as its own genre where people are making money off it, you know, and it stirs up questions. People are, are not resting in faith, they are in fear and suspicion. I had someone on my wall today tell me that she saw the debate between the grace and the works believers as a Hegelian dialectic where... The enemy was trying to synthesize a new uh, false paradigm through this, and she didn't know where to go, and as a result, she ended up back in legalism for a while. Now she's come back, but that's the, the fact that she can speak that language is due to this kind of exploration. I said, and, and, you know, I can't condemn anybody. I spent 25 years, 20 years studying that kind of stuff. It's like a hobby. And the Lord doesn't let me bring it up very often because it ministers questions, not God's economy, which is in faith. It does not produce, the, it, it is not according to the stewardship, it is not according to the mystery of Christ, it does not dispense Christ, and it doesn't produce faith. God's economy produces faith. Um, okay, so anyway... Sorry. Um, then he says, Now the end of the commandment is love out of a pure heart and a good conscience and a faith unfeigned. So the economy of God will produce love. Christ being dispensed and making his home in your heart through faith will cause you to be rooted and grounded in love. Not your love, but his love. Okay? And that will also produce a good conscience. That's versus an evil conscience that accuses you and keeps you coming. The evil conscience keeps you from coming forward to the throne of grace boldly and receiving grace. It makes you think that you need to do something in order to uh, satisfy God 
before you can come near, whether it's through your own repentance or your works. And that is that, that kind of dead works stuff is produced by an evil conscience, which comes out of the questions ministered by those who think they have a ministry but have swerved aside from God's economy, which is in faith. Um, give me just a minute. So anyway, um, so the economy of God will deal with the evil conscience and give you a good conscience. And a good conscience says, I am satisfied that the blood of Jesus Christ satisfied God and I can come near to him at any time and receive grace. And I don't have to clean myself up first. I come to him for cleansing. He has forgiven me. I have an advocate. He is for me and not against me. He loves me. That's what it does, okay? And then that is all in faith. Um, faith unfeigned. You know, we're not pretending to believe something. We genuinely do. We're not trying to believe something. We are resting in faith based on what we see. And what we see is because that there is a New Testament ministry that has supplied Christ as us as life and light. And we have seen him. And to the degree we've seen him, we've been satisfied with him. And it just puts us at rest. But then he says, that. so that's the end of the charge. End of the charge is charity out of a pure heart and a good conscience and a faith unfeigned. From which, now from what? From God's economy and from these things, some have swerved aside. Now the word there is misaimed like a bow and arrow. It's the same word we use in the New Testament for sinning, actually. Where you try to hit the target and you miss. Okay? So these are people who teach, but they have turned aside from the commandment and turned aside from uh, God's economy, which is in faith, to vain jangling. In other words, they're just talking. It's, futi it's futility because it doesn't produce anything good other than questions. Uh, am I right with God? Does he love me? Is it okay? Is this person deceiving me? Does that, you know, goes on and on. And what does it say? It says, they, why do they do this? Well, they desire to be teachers of the law. Desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what it is they affirm, or ne they don't understand what they say, in other words, or what they affirm. Now, what do they affirm? Well, the law, the purpose of the law is to establish your condemnation. You've not agreed with the law until you realize that the law put you on the cross. Until you see that the law is a ministry of condemnation and death, and is there to reveal sin and even cause the offense to abound so that you'll see how bad your nature is and you'll cry out, oh wretched man that I am who shall deliver me from the body of this death. You haven't agreed with the law. So the law is there to affirm your condemnation. And it is a schoolmaster to lead you to Christ, but once you're under Christ, you're no longer under that schoolmaster. And Romans 7 tells us that uh, we had to die to the law through the body of Christ so that we'd be lawfully joined to Christ. Otherwise, our union with Christ would be considered adultery. So it would be adultery for us to go back to the law. That's a kind of spiritual adultery. You don't believe me? Read Romans 7, 1 through 4. Um, but then he says, n n we know that the law is good because the law is holy and spiritual and good. The law is not the problem. Our flesh is the problem. And he says it's good if it's used lawfully, knowing that the law is not made for the righteous, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers and thieves, and fa uh, murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, manslayers, whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, men stealers, liars and perjured persons, and if there anything be contrary to sound doctrine according to the glorious gospel the blessed God which has been committed to my trust. Now the law condemns and exposes all these things and it's not for the righteous. Who are the righteous? The righteous are not those who are upright according to the law but those who have taken refuge in Jesus Christ and who work not but believe on him who justifies the ungodly and their faith has been counted to them as righteousness. That's the righteous. In contrast, there's all these evil things that uh, exist for those who are under the law, 
which is those who are not justified by faith. And here's what's interesting. All these things that are defined by the law, he says they're not according to sound doctrine, according to my glorious gospel of the blessed God, which has been committed to my trust. So the gospel automatically deals with these things. When you have the gospel, you've been washed. When you believe the gospel, you've been washed, you've been justified, you've been sanctified in the name of Jesus Christ and in the spirit of God. You have been washed from all those things. You are not any of those things anymore. And by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, especially if you are under the New Testament ministry, which ministers faith and produces the good conscience and, and roots you in the love of God and causes Christ to dwell in your heart, you will be washed. You will experientially, those things will come off you. The reason they don't come off people is because instead of ministering New Testament economy, people have misaimed desiring to be teachers of the law and have swerved aside to vain jangling. And instead of ministering faith, they minister questions. And this is a fundamental difference in ministry and the kind of fellowship it produces. You are either ministering according to God's economy by dispensing Christ by revealing his person and work and it's being received by faith in the hearers or rejected and if they reject it then they're under the law and they're condemned but if they accept it then it produces its fruit the word of God bears fruit and grows we don't have to tell people what to do all we have to do is lift up Jesus and he will draw all men to him. And that's the difference is because the law teacher wants to tell you what to do. They think the Christian life is a matter of here's what to do. And that's what the Christian bookstores and the institutional churches are full of is people telling people what to do. Not ministering Christ, but telling them to love Christ. Not revealing who Christ is and what he's done but telling you how much you should do for him and telling you that your growth spiritually is not a matter of Christ being supplied to you, but is a matter of you trying to do things for him, be more on fire, read your Bible more, pray more, go to more meetings, give more, be more generous, all of that. All of that is not according to God's economy. That is law teaching. What is law? Law is not just the Ten Commandments law was written in man's heart before the Ten Commandments ever came. Law is what we know we should do. It's anything that puts the demand on us. And it is a witness against us because of our flesh. Our flesh has sin in it and is hopelessly ruined. And God's answer for that is to crucify the old man. Crucify the flesh not build it up by telling it to try to perform, but send it to the cross through faith. And the New Testament ministry tells you about how you died with Christ, and you're raised together with him, and he's now in you, and he's your life, and he's to be your satisfaction. And by enjoying him and what he is, you will produce the fruit of the Spirit. Abide in the Lord, and his life is in you, and will produce its fruit. Okay, I do have to get going here, but this is, somebody asked me to do a part two of the God's Economy teaching, and I just wanted to distinguish it clearly from that which differs, and to tell you that there really is a difference, and there's going to be a division. We can't get along with people who don't teach according to God's economy, especially if we're teachers. We have to correct it and call it out, and we look like divisive ones as a result, but we're not. We are just saying, look, we have a different view of what the Christian life is going to be. It, And you may be a brother and sister, but you've misaimed. You're not teaching according to this economy, and you're producing questions, and it's vain jangling, and you're not ministering according to this commandment, which is to produce uh, the fruit of God's economy by dispensing Christ. There, It's a fundamental different thing. You either provide Christ as the supply, or you tell people what to do one or the other. And there's very few people, very few people that I've heard my entire Christian life who teach this way. 
the, the enemy has done a wonderful job of destroying the New Testament ministry. All right. I'll talk to you later. Oh, but I shouldn't say he destroyed it. He's distracted us from it, but the Lord is recovering it. Gloriously.